My name is Paul Kirchham. I was born 25 January 1920. I'm 102 years old. And I'm a, a Bataan Death March survivor. In my younger years, I had no idea of, of him being a POW. In fact, I think when we moved here and back in 1989 is when it started to change, when I really first heard his first talk and the horrendous things that he went through. Then it started me thinking about him and some of the issues he had and why he had them. And it gave me a lot of um, compassion for him. Grandma would um, intimate just that he, he's been in the war. Probably I was in my 20s when he really started opening up about what, was, what had happened. And even then it was all the funny stories. I met him when I was 14 years old. Um, he, he was in the Air Force. I didn't even know that he was in the Army. So that kind of sets the tone, right? I just knew he was in the Air Force. It wasn't until later that I even found out that her father was a survivor of Bataan. During the Great Depression, it was customary. You reach the age of 16, you dropped out of school, got a job, worked for two years, and helped to support your family. When I turned 16, I dropped out of school, got a job, worked for two years, and then 6 January 1938, I decided to join the, the Navy and see the world. Navy recruiter asked me, do I have a high school diploma? I said, no, uh, and he said, go across the hall, they'll take anybody. So I joined the Army. Well, I was on my, my second hitch, and uh, actually it was the picnic, really. I had a roll call in the morning, and then uh, we, were, we were off for the rest of the day. Once in a while, we'd go out on maneuvers, but it was like a picnic. When the main line of resistance collapsed on the early of January 1942, now the main line was handled by the Philippine Army, and the Philippine Division was ordered to counterattack. We we counterattacked. Quite a few guys lost their lives. A lot of them from snipers in the jungle, and that's when reality really set in. There was no longer a picnic. That night before the surrender, our, our Captain Thompson gathered what few of us were left, and he says, the surrender is going to take place tomorrow. And he says, as far as I'm concerned, you're all on your own. So Corporal Hicks, the other squad leader, and I took off to the jungle. And we rolled all overnight, and uh, next morning, we stumbled into a Japanese camp. Thank God it was a quartermaster camp, because we could tell a dozen trucks a lot of bundles and things like that. No helmets, no weapons. And we talked for a while. Uh, finally, they put us on a truck, and when they closed the flat, one of them went. So they drove us uh, for a while, stopped, and there was a fenced-in area. They got us over the fence and took off. And it was a schoolyard, and we found out the first uh, step of the death march was from there and there were field devils in the camp already. So we joined the Bataan Death March. During the actual Bataan Death March, we, we were formed in three lines, and I was always in the middle line because last line along the road, uh, the Japanese trucks were heading for Marvelous because Corregidor was still holding up. 
and they would whack the people in that line with their rifles and whatever they had in their hands. So I found out, stay in the middle line, and I just watched the shoes in front of me, and that was it. When we were at the cabanas, we were at a prison camp, and then the POW and I were on a, a litter detail, carrying oranges to the Japanese uh, kitchen. We had a, a Japanese guard with us, and one time he said, okay, stop for a rest. And he turned around, and I grabbed three oranges and put them under my straw hat, you know. He was going to try and get it back to the rest of the guys. And we started to walk again, and my hat was sort of turning. And, and I, he kept looking at me out of the corner of his eye. You know, observed his hat moving around on his head, which was not too, you know, it's kind of a clue, right? I knew I was in deep trouble because when we first entered the prison camp, Cabana uh, one, they handed each of us the uh, rules of the camp. Everything ended up, you would either be shot or severely beaten. And stealing was one of those rules. So I figured I was in deep trouble. We stopped again. He took my hat off. The oranges fall out. He picked up two and gave them back to him. He said, two, Joto, good. He said, Ichi, Damidra. Three, no, no. Yeah. And he whacked me on a butt. <laughs> well, I could have been, could have beat the death a shot, you know. October 1943, I was part of a 500 man work detail sent to an area near the village of Las Pinas, 40 miles of Manila. There, for the next 12 months, we built an airfield for the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese guard, he was a he was built like a brick, brick, you know what? He walked around with a, with a pick handle. So he asked, anybody here have surveying experience? Uh, I looked around at the picks and shovels, dummy me. Yeah. For, yeah, for about two weeks, I, I walked around like a big shot, you know? Uh, one day he came, got on his hand and knees, and the runway would go like that. He came over and whacked me on the knees with his pick handle. Well, I was lucky because I saw guys getting killed for doing less than that, you know. Yeah. Uh, early November 1944, we were at the end of the runway when one of the men began yelling and pointing towards Manila. There in the sky above Manila, Japanese and American aircraft in aerial combat. Later we learned that was the time General MacArthur returned to the Philippines. Next morning, 1,100 of us were put aboard the Japanese Haro Maru. Uh, our ship was part of a nine-ship convoy with Japanese destroyer escort headed for Japan. The, the convoy no sooner left Manila Bay than we came under American submarine attack. The holes were covered, we remained in complete darkness. All I kept hearing what seemed like endless days, the explosions from the depth charges of the Japanese destroyers, the constant swerving and zigzagging of our ship. After 18 horrendous days and nights, we ended up in Hong Kong. When we docked in Hong Kong, I happened to be by the ladder and a Japanese guard motioned for me to come up to the ladder. I grabbed a water hose, dirty myself, drank and drank and drank, filled my two canteens, hooked them back in my belt. Then I proceeded to fill canteens and water bottles as they were sent up to the two holds. This went on for three or four hours when lo and behold, somewhere from China, here come American aircraft looking for targets of opportunity. Back down in a hole, off we went again. Three days, three or four days later, we pulled into Taiwan. After two weeks on uh, at Taiwan, we were put aboard the Australian cruise ship, the Melbourne Maru. After two weeks, we headed north, headed for Japan. After an eventful trip, we pulled into Moji on the northern tip of Kyushu, the second largest Japanese island. We were ferried across the bay, we were stuffed into a train, and headed north. Now this was November 1944. Eventually we reached 
Port City of Sendai. There, we took a narrow gauge railroad way up in the mountain to the village of Atakura. When we got up there, we worked at Mitsubishi Mine number 11 until the end of the war. One day, uh, instead of taking us down to the mine at six o'clock, they took us down at 10 o'clock. And when we got there, they put machine guns on one, each end of our outfit. And there was a, a Japanese uh, general on a telephone. He put the phone back on and talked to the lieutenant, marched us back up to the hill, and the next day, B-29 came over and dro dropped food, medicine, and clothing, and news that the war ended. But a few days before that, the B-29 came over and bombed the smelter, a few buildings in the area, and the narrow gauge railroad. And that was the only way to get down to Sendai no road, and we had to wait in the camp for 30 days while the railroad was repaired. After World War II, uh, I, I re-enlisted into the, what was then the Army Air Corps, you know, and there were about 30 of us from the 31st Infantry that uh, re-enlisted, and we were stationed at March Fields, California, and we were complete basket cases. We probably had PTSD, but it was unheard of at the time. Uh, we broke every rule and regulation at the base, and even some of the rules and regulations at the local city of Riverside. Eventually, most of us were busted down to private. His wife was a very pivotal person in his, his um, development to the person that he is today. I got to mention Gloria again. After we went to the Air Force, uh, it took us about a year before I got over uh, the PTSD and she stuck by me uh, day and night. She would get after him when he started doing things, you know, and she would, you know, say, Paul, don't talk bad about people. Right? We don't talk bad about people. She, you know, she laid down the law with him, and and he would he would say, yeah, okay, Gloria, and, and do it. You know, she she was the love of my life. She she passed away two years ago, and uh, uh, we've been married for 74 years. One short of the diamond <laughs> deal, uh, 74, yeah, and. Uh, I don't know, if it wasn't for her, I don't know how I could have made it, to tell you the truth. Yeah. One time I asked him about God in prison camp, and he said to me, there was no God. But now I think that's what brought him to the point of forgiving and, and letting go, is um, his faith. It wasn't long after World War II that in my heart, I, I forgave them what they did. Once he was able to accept and forgive, then he moved on. He's very generous. He's a philanthropist. He's helped so many people financially. He's just a good man. And he's never one of those people that thinks that because he did something for you, you owe him. He and Grandma have always had a very hospitable house. It's part of generosity. I hope I can pass that on to my own kids and grandkids. It's been tough. I think the world's kind of closed in on him a little bit since hitting his hundreds. It's been a little more difficult, you know, but he was always active in church. He was always active um, with the, going down to little league teams that he was sponsoring. Um, but yeah, he's had to slow down, obviously. I think his, his, his knee, which he totally blames on the Japanese, um, has really kept him from doing more right now. But I mean, if that's the worst that he's got from the Japanese so far, he's, he's 102, he's doing good. He's always loved life. He wouldn't be here this long if he didn't love life and always made the best of it. Always found something to laugh about, something to joke about. He's just got a lot going for him.